Hello and welcome to Mostly Climate. My name is Dr Rosie Oakes and I'm joined here today by my co-host Dr Doug McNeil. Today we're going to be talking to you about cities. Why are cities so important? Actually, more than half of the world's population already live in cities and this is projected to increase in the future. This year we've seen some really hot temperatures, remembering that the UK reached 40 degrees C for the first time. And the impacts of these high temperatures are felt most strongly in cities. And we're going to learn a little bit more about why that's the case today. We're really lucky today to be joined by our colleague from the Met Office, Dr Lizzie Good. And Lizzie's going to talk to us about the work that her team are doing in urban areas. Hi, Lizzie. Welcome to the show. Can you tell us a bit about what you do here at the Met Office? Hi, I'm Lizzie and my team are mostly focused on using satellite data to look at cities and we've been using these data to map the variability of surface temperatures in urban areas. Certain areas of the cities are showing up as very hot, so we have these heat maps of the cities and other areas are much cooler. And the other thing we find about cities and towns in general is that they tend to be much warmer than the surrounding rural areas. And we call this the urban heat island effect, or when we're using satellite data, the surface urban heat island effect. Can you explain what that is? What's causing the urban heat island effect in a city? Cities are made up of materials that absorb heat very, very well, so concrete, bricks and things like that, Uh, whereas surrounding rural areas tend to be full of more vegetation, trees, forests, that kind of thing. And trees and grass and all these plants are very good at transpiring and keeping themselves cool, so their breathing process keeps that surface very, very cool. The satellites must give you a really good overview of what's going on. Can you explain how the satellites work? How often do they pass over? Are they there all the time or are they going around the Earth? What, what's happening with the satellites? Yeah, so we have two different primary kinds of satellites. We have one kind of satellite that we use a lot in the images that you see on the weather forecasts. And these are our weather satellites and they are geostationary. They image constantly over one place on the Earth. And so they see things with very high resolution every half an hour over 15 minutes or even more frequently. But what we tend to use for urban studies are polar orbiting satellites. So these are satellites that go round the Earth and they have a much higher spatial resolution. So they can give us the spatial detail that we need to see over cities. And the data that we use are at least one kilometre in spatial resolution. But many of the modern satellites actually provide even higher spatial resolution. So this gives us a really detailed picture of the heat in the urban area and how that varies from point to point. So the high resolution data that you have in cities, why is that so important when you're looking at an urban area compared to a rural area, for example? Well, I think they can be important in rural areas as well, actually, if we're mapping different kinds of fields and so for irrigation, farmers watering their crops. But in urban areas, what's so key there is that buildings, I mean, if you go out and walk around a city, you can see how much it varies from space to space. You have areas of green, you have parkland and you have tree lined roads. In other areas, you have very densely packed buildings and a wide network of roads and there's very little greenery. So then when you've got all of this data, this amazing high resolution data of heat in urban areas, what do you do with it? What can we use it for? Do you have any examples from your work where there's been kind of a practical use for this data? What we hope to do is to be able to map these urban hotspots, so the areas where the temperatures are highest. And then we hope that we can use these data to target for things like urban greening, so green roofs, or painting the tops of roofs with highly reflective paint. And this has been done in other areas of the world to reduce the temperatures uh, which would be seen by satellites. And so it's a really useful tool for us to find these hotspots and where we can reduce these. And actually, they have done this in some cities. So, for example, in Philadelphia, there was a study a number of years ago where they used satellite data to map these hotspots and then they then targeted initiatives to reduce temperatures. And this is something that we hope to replicate in other cities. And so we've been focusing on China, actually, in this particular project. As well as working in China, we have other people at the Met Office who are working all over the world. Previously, I talked to Victoria Ramsey from the Urban Climate Services team. Victoria and her team have been working with a number of UK local authorities over the last few years to develop an urban heat climate service. One of the cities they've worked really closely with is Belfast. So my question to Victoria was, why Belfast? 
We've had some quite extreme heat events over the last number of years. If you think back to just July this year, the Met Office issued its first ever red extreme heat warning and the UK reached 40 degrees for the first time ever. Like many cities across the UK, Belfast is becoming increasingly impacted by heat, perhaps not to the same extent as the likes of the cities in, say, the southeast of England, but it's still becoming an issue. At the start of this project, we held some workshops with city stakeholders from the council, emergency planning, community organisations. They sort of recognised that the response to heat is more of a reactive one compared to other extreme weather events like flooding or extreme cold. So we've been working to develop some information on urban heat risk in the city. What kind of information did you share with them to help them prepare for heat? We developed a set of fact sheets that we call the heat pack and what that does is it aims to build awareness of heat hazards and impacts within the city. We looked at the likes of different temperature thresholds that are linked to different impacts across the city for health, for transport, for energy and we put all this information into this fact sheet that they can then use to um, engage with other decision makers and kind of just build this awareness around what is happening within the city around heat. Where is the highest risk in Belfast? How at risk you are to heat can depend on a number of things. For example, whether you live in the top floor of an apartment building, if you have an underlying medical condition that makes you more sensitive to heat, or the level of deprivation in an area can determine whether people have the means to adapt to heat. Um, what we do is we we take our climate information and combine it with socioeconomic information as well as information on the built environment. And we come up with a risk rating for each electoral ward within Belfast. And we look also at how this changes over time. So it gives city decision makers a starting point to see where they may want to prioritise adaptations or inform city investment to tackle heat issues. Victoria Ramsey. Lizzie. What does heat do to a human body and how might you mitigate the effects of a heat wave? There are various ways that the body is affected by heat. We know about air temperature and that's obviously quite well understood, but actually things like wind and humidity also affect how the body responds to heat and actually the solar radiation as well. So whether you're standing in the shade or the sun, I'm sure we can all remember situations where we've done that and felt much more comfortable in the shade. But the interesting thing about satellite data as well that we're using for this study is that they're also sensitive to the radiation coming off buildings. So you may think of yourself of times when you stood next to a building and you felt how hot it is and how uncomfortable it is to stand next to it. And that's something else that satellites can give us is something about the radiation coming off the building. So it's very useful. But I think the most useful approach actually is to use all these data together. So conventional data from weather stations, which measure air temperature, humidity, wind speed and some solar radiation as well, but also data from satellites. And I think it's using all these data together, which gives us the best picture of how heat stress can really affect the human body. So clearly satellites have been a really big step forward in terms of being able to measure this. You know, you've got a lot of satellites, huge amount of data coming in. So, for example, maybe one of your cities, there are a number of cities in China that you were running this project on. Is that right? That's right. Yes. Yes. How how many cities did you have? Well, we we just did a prototype study, which was four cities in China, which included Beijing and Shanghai, obviously very well known Some pretty major cities, cities in China. Yes, indeed. Absolutely. So if you could build a digital twin, a representation of Beijing and your satellite could feed in information into that digital twin, how long do you think it would take to get to that kind of technology? I think that potentially is quite a way off but it's a very interesting idea and one of the things that we can really benefit from satellite data is the timeliness of delivery of the data so um, I mentioned earlier that many satellites are used in weather forecasting and these are very short time scales that we need the data on so what you're talking about here I think is is something similar and we often have the satellite data within 30 minutes of acquisition uh, which is incredibly useful and many of the the stations that we have also come in very very quickly the data Um, but many don't and in our data sets that we create in climate science sometimes we need to wait months for the data set to be fully updated with all the stations that we have because they take a while to come in Uh, so I think satellite data can really play a role here because potentially we have the whole earth imaged on a time scale of of twice a day multiple times per day um, and that data can be with us very very quickly as I say within 30 minutes or so sometimes.
what did you find when you mapped these four big cities in China? And I know you created a map tool. So what did you find when you did this work? We projected the satellite data. So we laid it over a map of streets and also uh, visible satellite imagery. So that's as if you were taking a picture of the Earth from space and you could see trees and rivers and things like this. So we, we could lay the temperature data over both of these kinds of other data. And that enabled us to map and to understand why the temperature varied so much spatially. So we could see very clearly that cooler areas were associated with water bodies and vegetation. And warmer areas were associated where buildings were much more densely populated and there was much less vegetation around. As I said earlier, the other thing we found as well is that there's a very large difference of several degrees between the city and the surrounding rural area in terms of the temperatures there. And so you can imagine during a heat wave, if you're experiencing temperatures in the rural area and then you move into an urban area where this temperature is uh, so much hotter, it can be obviously much more uncomfortable comfortable. Lizzie, you were talking about gaps in the data and being able to fill those data gaps with satellites. And I understand that you've been working on a paper recently that's not completely to do with this project, but is pretty relevant. Yes, exactly. So as you said, I already mentioned, we have temporal gaps in data. So often station data can take a while to come in. But the other thing we have as well is that the network is incomplete. So we have a fantastic global network of weather stations and some areas are very well observed. But there are other areas where there are virtually no observations at all. So like, for example, much of Africa is very poorly observed. And of course, the poles are very poorly observed as well. Um, and satellite data can also help us fill in gaps in these areas. And the paper uh, that we published recently, we calculated trends in satellite data and compared those to trends in in situ data. And we found that they were statistically not different. So they essentially we can consider that they're the same, basically. And this is incredibly useful because that means potentially we can use satellite data to calculate trends in surface temperature in areas where we don't have weather stations, uh, which is incredibly useful, obviously, because we don't really know what's going on in in those areas. We know that different parts of the earth are warming faster than other parts, but we don't have the whole picture because we don't have all the observations uh, from, from the weather stations. Is there anywhere on the earth that satellites can't measure very well? Are there any satellite data gaps? Um, well, when we're measuring surface temperatures, some of the satellites that we use can't see through clouds. Uh, and that is a major problem because that does lead to gaps. Uh, but we have other satellite data that see surface temperature through clouds as well. So as I said before, I think really the, the value is in using all these data types together. So the weather station data, data from ships and buoys, radiosons and satellites together is really where we need to be going. What's just over the horizon, maybe not in the far future, but you know, what would you like to see happen next with this kind of tool and its development? Well, I think um, the tool is very useful, as I said, to complement existing observations that we have of the weather and heat stress and how humans are affected. So that's very important. But potentially the tool could be expanded to all other cities. We have data over the whole Earth from satellites, right from pole to pole. We have detailed spatial maps of heat. Uh, so we could map these, uh, the variation in surface temperatures for any city on Earth. I'm just thinking it seems like such a good resource for cities. How much effort would it take to make that data available to people who want it around the world? Well, the data are actually already very readily available, but they're readily available for scientists to use, but not right. everyday people and not health planners, not urban planners. And I think that's what this tool really allows us to do is to translate the data that we're very used to dealing with as scientists into a format that can be used by people who don't have expertise in satellite data. Because as you say, the volumes of data are just fast. We have observations many, many times times a day from many, many satellites at spatial scales of one kilometre or even finer scale than that. Um, and so you can imagine the huge volumes of data that we have. And, and that just isn't practical for urban planners or heat uh, or health workers to, to use. So I think that's the role of this tool, really, was to put it into a format that's more readily available. If you could talk to anybody planning a city, what would you say to them based on the data that you've collected? <laughs> 
Oh, that's quite tricky. Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of things obviously to consider when designing new urban areas. And I'm not an urban design expert, but I think, you know, some of the things that we can see from the satellite data could be very useful for people in the early stages of urban planning to take that into consideration. You know, what kind of materials are we building with that make areas hotter? Um, what are the effects of green roofs, for example, or buildings painted with reflective paint and how those can impact the cities that they're designing? Thank you very much to our guest today, Dr. Lizzie Good, and thank you also to Victoria Ramsey. Thanks to my co-host, Dr. Doug McNeil. This has been Mostly Climate. The producer was Claire Nazir, and the editor is Adrian Holloway. Mostly Climate is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.